Information and communication technology can be a great gateway for all Indians. Opening the door to justice. Opening up access to key public services and basic human rights. Opening up the past and igniting the spark of collaboration. ICT is the ultimate tool in creating an open, creative and equal space where all citizens can live up to their truest potential. How? Take a look. Thanks to computation and ICT, we are living in an era of unprecedented access to information. Today, a whole universe of data is available at the click of a button. Want to learn quantum mechanics? Click on an online tutorial. Want to know the distance between Madurai and Bhilwara? Click on an online map. Want to learn about the history of the Marathas or how to grow tomatoes? Click on an online encyclopedia. This is also an era of big data, where thanks to the power of computers to store and process information. Today we have the largest amount of digital and numerical data than at any time in history. Census data that numbers in the billions. Scientific data like genome mapping or physics experiments like the LHC that generate millions of information packets. Weather data from land, sea and atmosphere that's processed by supercomputers. There is information swirling around us all the time in humongous volumes, ready to be processed, understood and used. Never has it been more accurate to say that knowledge is power. In October 2005, the Indian Parliament enacted the Right to Information Act. Under this act, citizens can access information from any public authority in order to make governments more accountable. Now for a nominal fee of 10 rupees, any Indian citizen can file an RTI request with a public information officer. Their request must be completed within 30 days. RTI is a powerful piece of legislation that makes governance more transparent and empowers citizens simply by opening up access to data. These are the officers of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative. In India, we've been at the forefront of the campaign for the people's right to information to be legislated upon, to set up mechanisms for people to be able to seek information from government as a matter of right and get it within a specific time limit and to the extent of their uh, you know, requirement. This organization uses open government data as a tool to fight for rights, especially in the criminal justice system. One of its team works to strengthen the police system to ensure that police districts across India remain efficient in fighting crime and protecting their jurisdiction. An arrest affects the civil liberty of a person. So it's very important to uh, put the information of uh, a person's arrest in the public domain. A huge part of this team's work involves conducting research across various police districts. This is information that is not openly available on easily accessible platforms. We tried to do a simple study, a crime mapping study in a capital city of Delhi. What we found was that there is no data available in the public domain. So we had to go back to the primary source, that is the police station. So, so we, uh, we went and uh, collected data from each and every police station of Delhi, that is 161 police stations of Delhi. So we had to collect FIRs from each police station. We went there and we inspected the documents, got it photocopied, got it in soft copy in different forms. So it was a very, very tedious task which took around a year. That's one year of time that could have been spent analysing the information and advocating for improvements in the police system. The question arose, what could information and communication technologies do to ease the process? Turns out, the Indian government had an ambitious plan in the anvil. It had the potential to change the culture of governance. Around 2010, a new idea was taking shape across the world. Open data in government. 
This meant taking the thousands of data sets accumulated by various government departments and making them available to the public via the internet. Governments are embracing open data uh, in a big way, primarily because you know, the government by its basic nature of function possess a whole lot of data. Government conducts a whole lot of surveys, weather data, um, various indices data and all kind of other services data is there, traffic data for that matter. So uh, there, is, there is a perception since all these data is being collected using public money, this data should be given back to public for reuse and repurpose for that matter. Digital data sets are packets of digital and numerical information pertaining to one subject for a particular time period. By studying data sets, one can find a sense of what's happening on the ground and then advocate for improvements. For example, a data set that was released by the Ministry of Water Resources brought about lasting change. Now that data set actually contains information about every single hand pump or bore well that has been sunk in every village across every district across every state in this country. Now it also indicates in that data set which ones of these bore wells and which of these hand pumps are functional and if they are non-functional then what is the reason. Now if that can be combined with let's say local um, uh, organizational capacity where local NGOs or let's say volunteer groups are equipped with GPS devices. They could easily go and locate those hand pumps and bore wells and there could be a mechanism of feedback to show that what has been the reason why these things are not functioning, what action has been taken to remedy the problem. So in that sense, a service that has become dysfunctional can be made functional once again simply using this data set. In 2012, India launched its national open government data platform, data.gov.in. Over 100 different government departments contribute their data to the portal, where once specific information had to be requested and sourced one data set at a time. Now there are over 25,000 data sets available openly to the public on a single platform. So this is the platform where you have everything in one shot. You can see what is the data which has been published. You can download the data and you could make more value of the data which was actually lying in silos in their websites and in their files. So from this portal, a layman can choose the sector they want. If it is health, then they can just go to health sector and click on health and family welfare and you will be able to get all the data sets of this sector on, in one shot and in one screen. So, who uses information like this? It could be a researcher, a journalist, a member of parliament voting on a draft policy or an advocacy group pushing for social change. Like this CHRI team, which monitors the prison system in India. So when we say monitor, it just doesn't mean going physically and monitoring. That is also a part of it. But it also means making prisons more op open so that people can actually see what exactly is happening in our criminal justice system. Is it effective? Are people really getting reformed? Open government data goes a long way in answering these critical questions with just a simple browse of the data portal. In the keyword I type here, depths of inmates. Just by three clicks, now I know the last 12 years in which state how many deaths happened due to inside prison. If I, want to, if I want to go beyond that, I want to see what are the reasons for these deaths. So I click on details. Every year for every district, every state and union territory, I know deaths happened due to suicide, due to execution. If the inmates fought between each other and, and somebody died, if I need to know in a specific jail in Madhya Pradesh, if there are if there are the deaths are rising, if there are a lot of suicides happening. That's a policy intervention you can make based on relevant information that you get. That's only possible when you have data in such a form. When multiple data sets are available on single platform, the advantages are many. One can detect trends across different parts of the country and across time periods. 
one can also make links between two different data sets. So here I have a data set called State Reunion Territory Wise Distribution of Suicides. Now if I go to, if I click that and I look at this data from 2001 uh, to 12, now the idea is then to connect these two data sets. And we did that and I'll, I'll just share a small analysis that we did uh, some a uh, few months back where we found that the propensity to commit suicide in prisons was one and a half times more than outside. Another huge advantage of the open government data portal is that all its information is machine readable. Machine readable formats are digital formats like Excel sheets, which can be used for analysis and statistical calculations using different computer software applications. This is a huge improvement from getting RTI documents in hard copies that then had to be scanned one by one into soft copies. There was initially no software that would convert a scanned file into a machine readable file. So therefore, if you wanted to do any analysis, you had to still sit down and type out the whole thing onto any uh, you know, platform like an MS Excel or whatever. And then you did your calculation. Machine readability is an invaluable tool for researchers and analysts. But in this day and age of mobile smartphones, there's another very important advantage. From tourism info to postal data, from market prices to farmer-friendly apps, computer and mobile developers are free to use data sets to create more awareness and improved services. The portal addresses the needs of researchers, analysts and developers. But what about lay people who may not be computer savvy or be able to decode statistical and numerical data? Is there something on the portal that makes it easier to consume data sets? Yes, it is the graphical interface of visualizations, which takes numbers and turns them into images. This is a, one of the uh, data sets on a peak demand and power, uh, peak power supply during the September month of 2015. So we have represented uh, through a map uh, this peak supply. If you see the data uh, here, this is the data in our quantitative form where the data is represented, uh, being represented here. This data, if a person wants to understand the data, there uh, they have to go through uh, many parameters and they will not be able to comprehend it much uh, easily. So if, we see, if you, they see this particular map from this, they can easy, easily see which state has, uh, how perform uh, the supply, peak demand and supply of a part of a particular state, which is being represented data through this screen only. Uh, you can see from the different uh, color uh, codings have been represented, one can see this is, one can understand in which range particular state comes in. For example, if you say, uh, if you see for, for a category which is below 9, for the yellow uh, color categories like Jammu, Kashmir, Uttar Pradesh and Anutarachal Pradesh uh, comes under the below 9 category. So that is easily uh, understandable from here only. From here, there are different uh, charting options are available. Through these charting options, one can use particular uh, thing and uh, make the visualization accordingly. These may seem like simple interventions, but they help reach out to a vast number of users, from laypersons to activists, and even the lofty corridors of parliament. Having hard data at one's fingertips is proving to be an empowering tool unlike any other. For a long time, our advocacy was based on principles, human rights principles, human rights standards, standards laid down by the law. But now, it was, it increasingly it became important to show why certain things are not working and that could be shown only on the basis of access to information. One is, you know, the, the basic sense when I'm opening data, it gives a sense of transparency on the part of government. So like your turn, government is more transparent, your government is more engaging. And when you allow people to use this data, it creates a kind of a collaboration, crowdsourcing. So that's another thing which is a very important tenant of good governance. With more and more information pouring into the open government data portal, the democratic institutions of India are being strengthened. But there's another way in which open source digital platforms give us access, not just to our future, but also to the past. Find out more after the break.
On the banks of the Sabarmati River in Gujarat is one of the most iconic reminders of India's greatest leader, Mahatma Gandhi. This ashram is where he lived, wrote and practiced his powerful tenets of non-violent civil disobedience against British colonial rule. This is where lakhs of visitors still come every year to remind themselves of his philosophy. This is a place from which you want to take the ideas and have people, contemporary uh, young people, to understand uh, what Gandhiji stood for and the type of person he was at the place which was his uh, area of work. For a leader who believed his life was his message, Gandhiji would be pleased to know that today, information and communication technologies are taking his message far and wide via the Gandhi Heritage Portal. You see, IT now brings out possibilities which we just did not have in the earlier times. You also have children wanting to understand Gandhi, but you have a scholar wanting to understand Gandhi. And how do you deal with that? The same thing applies with languages. This is a place where we have people from all over the world, all over India. A whole group comes who wants to understand this whole thing in Tamil or in, in Malayalam or in, in Urdu or something else. Now, how do you do all that? Now, IT enables you to do it. The Gandhi Heritage Portal is a one-stop online resource for all things related to the life and ideas of Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. It functions on the digital philosophy of open source. What is open source? Open source refers to something that is publicly accessible and can be shared and modified freely. The term was first coined to denote software that could be shared and modified by its users according to their needs. For example, the Linux operating system that unlike others allows its users to custom design its features. But in the digital era, open source has a much wider meaning beyond software. It's a tool to build online communities and join people with shared values and interests. At the Gandhi Heritage Portal, this denotes the throwing open of an entire library of resources. From written text, to photographs, films, and even the very ashram where Gandhiji spent his seminal years. The purpose is to create what perhaps would be the country's first open source archive. Uh, open source in two ways that we are actually uh, hoping to place in public domain for researchers and for everybody, all the material that's available, uh, archival and non-archival, uh, on the life and times and thought of Mahatma Gandhi. At the heart of the Gandhi Heritage Portal, or GHP, is the CWMG, or Collected Works of Mahatma Gandhi. An ambitious project that began in 1956 and was completed in 1994. The CWMG is a chronological collection of 1,000 volumes containing every single piece of writing associated with Gandhiji. The GHP has converted these volumes into online texts in English, Hindi and Gujarati. In order to bring this portal to life, each and every page of every text had to be digitized. One option was to scan. Scanning is a process by which hard copies like paper-based documents are transformed into digital images. Usually done in offices, scanning is done by flatbed machines like these. But that wasn't possible for the GHP. Why? Because some of the texts are over 100 years old and are handwritten or just too fragile. There should be no disturbance of the original text. And therefore, the f process of photographic digitization was adopted. So each page is photographed. Ad adequate care has to be taken at the photographic stage itself, that the, uh, it is readable, it's correct. What should be the kind of uh, resolution that you will adopt? In image-based scanning, two digital cameras are placed in strategic positions and the whole scene is lit like a miniature film set. The text is placed delicately in a cradle 
so as to preserve the paper. This job may look straightforward, but it is not so simple. Gandhiji was not easy for a digitizing person. He wrote on some of the thinnest pieces of paper, there'd be something typed at the back, he would reuse that paper. So the minute you try and take a photograph, you get the back side and not the front side, which is written in a, not even an HB pencil, it's written in a light pencil sometimes. So how do you do it? And it required uh, real precision to be able to do it. In order to make these images into machine-readable formats that are searchable, the GHP team must create metadata for each source. Another technology used to make the pages machine-readable is OCR or Optical Character Recognition. OCR is a technology by which image-based characters are converted into digital, machine-readable text by using special software. Although this is a largely automated exercise, there is a big need for human intervention. I think we are unique in the sense that we've checked every page. There might have been an error or two which would have crept in, but we are open to suggestions, corrections. But our attempt really is to provide 100% verified data. In this way, the words of Mahatma Gandhi are able to time travel. But it's not just Gandhiji's words that are making the leap from history to the present. After the break, we see how the concept of digital heritage unfolds far beyond the written word. In Gujarat Sabarmati Ashram, history is getting a digital makeover. The Gandhi Heritage Portal is creating one of the largest online repositories of resources related to the life and times of Mahatma Gandhi. Today, the portal contains nearly 8 lakh pages of archival materials, with 8 to 10,000 fresh pages being uploaded every month. These pages can be accessed by anyone including the visually impaired, who have special features to assist them. The GHP is traversing geographic locations, language and disability. And whether you're a scholar or a school student, there's something for everyone. In fact, now, the most popular device of mobile phones is making the ashram more accessible. If you have a smartphone, you can connect to the ashram's Wi-Fi and automatically it links you to a virtual tour guide. As you roam the various rooms, corridors and cottages, a visual and audio guide tells you interesting facts about what you're experiencing. And what if you are not actually at the ashram? Android and iOS apps allow you to do the same from the comfort of your home. We don't want Gandhi to be like, like something which you see outside, but Gandhi is something which, which relates to your life, relates to you. He was a person, but he was a person who who, who searched himself and through that inner search uh, could impact the world. If Gandhiji had all the IT available today, uh, what could he have done? And I think we'll leave the audience with that question. Gandhiji's most enduring message was of inclusivity and openness. In this spirit of openness, the Sabarmati Ashram itself is opening up through the tools of digital heritage. Digital heritage is a means to preserve and conserve our physical heritage like monuments, artifacts and objects through technologies like 3D laser mapping. Gandhiji's personal quarters, the Hride Kunj, is being mapped using these special techniques. A technology is called LIDAR where, uh, I mean for example, uh, each and every building of the ashram can be scanned with the LIDAR equipment and that can be stored for the future use. You can say uh, a millimeter level data can be captured. You, we can create a 3D model of the Sabarmati Ashram or, or a particular building of the Ashram. So that is uh, also we are doing. In this digital age, a new open culture is building brand new communities, not just in history or in present day governance. Today, whether it is scientific or artistic collaboration, Open data is bringing people together. It's a wave that India is just beginning to ride towards a more progressive, inclusive and creative tomorrow. 
Please send your suggestions and comments to Vigyan Prasar, A50 Institutional Area, Sector 62, Noida, 201309. You can also email us at info at vigyanprasar.gov.in.